Welcome to episode 14 of More Than Just Maps. I'm your host, Ollie Powers. This podcast was created with the intent to help anyone in the GIS field get from where they are now to where they want to be, be that your first job, a career move, or just improving your GIS game overall. On today's episode, I conclude my interview with Jordan Carmona as we wrap up our discussion on the GISP. We dive into why each of us wanted the certification in the first place, and then we crack open the technical exam, as much as we can, for those who are looking for some insight into this sometimes controversial test. And welcome back to part two with my interview with Jordan Carmona, and we are talking about the GISP. Um, so on this episode, we're actually going to focus more on the exam. We covered a lot in the previous episode um, about what the GISP is and, and how to go about building it for the portfolio portion of it. Um, but there is that dreaded exam component. So we're going to focus a lot on that today. However, before we jump into the exam, uh, Jordan, let's talk a little bit more about how, why each of us wanted to get our GISPs. Um, so let's start with you and, and what made you want to, to get that certification? Listeners that live outside the Metroplex, EFW is a pretty tight job market uh, in terms of uh, spatial, right? For every position, you're going to get hundreds uh, of applicants. Mm -hmm. So for... For me, it's very, uh, very economic lens of I wanted to look better than other people, you know, to be able to get to the interview round. And so that was that was my thing is I knew that if I wanted to be able to compete with some of the higher tier jobs, uh, especially the scarce local government jobs, uh, that I would have to be stand out. And so my assumption was, uh, especially after seeing a bunch of different job adverts, was that the GISP, although like recommended, was actually going to be required in order to be seriously considered, now, especially, you know, not having a master's degree, right? And not having a, a GIS degree, uh, per se. That would be especially helpful then. <laughs> uh, so what about you? What, uh, what were your motivations for getting the GISP? Uh, well, so I'm actually from Canada. I don't know how many people know that, but now a bunch more people know that, um, specifically from Toronto and the job market in Toronto was even worse than the Metroplex here, um, especially for entry level positions. Um, if you were, if you were an intermediate or advanced in GIS, there were a ton of jobs for you, but it was next to impossible to get entry level positions. Um, in the in the Toronto area, uh, so one of the things, and so I while I did grad school, I actually did a graduate certificate. So I don't have my master's; I have a graduate certificate, which you can't really put numbers on next to your name. Um, and it doesn't. A lot of people don't recognize a graduate certificate, even though I probably did as much work for that as I would have for a master's. Um, so I just needed something that was going to help me also stand out in the job market. Um, I was very very lucky to get the positions I did while I was living in Canada before I moved to the U.S. But I wanted to have something that was going to ensure that I was going to stand out over other people like you um, just to make sure I could be employable. And it was just something I wanted to achieve that after I finished grad school, it was kind of like, well, what's next? What's next? What's next? So that was kind of the here's what's next. Aim for that kind of thing, um, because it is kind of a little bit disorienting once you finish school and you, you go back out into the world and you're like, oh, what do I do now? It's it's kind of a weird time in your life. So that kind of helped me deal with that a little bit as well. Yeah, I definitely agree that the after school, right? What what achievements are you are you trying to to get, you know, outside of job promotions and stuff? And for spatial professionals, if you're not doing skills based things, then yeah, the GISB is the thing to get. Especially since you look at other professions like engineering and planners and they all have their certifications that they're still working for towards. Um, so why shouldn't we have the same thing? Definitely. Definitely. So with that, let's move on to the exam. <laughs> so Jordan, when did you write your exam? Ooh, okay. So I did my exam in summer of 2018 okay yes yeah, summer of 2018 and then i 
finished wrangling my points uh, by December. Uh, but yes, I did the exam uh, and passed, and it was, you know, totally, totally nerve wracking, but I'm sure we can dive into all that. Yeah. Um, so I, like I mentioned last episode, I had to do the exam twice. I just missed the passing grade by like, it was less than percent I pass, that I didn't pass it on the first one. So that was infuriating. Um, then I had to do it again. I had to do all that prep work again, which was the worst part. Um, so, and I did mine in, I think May, 2017. And then again, in November of 2017. And it kind of, it kind of stinks. Cause when you fail, they will give you a score of like what what you got in each category what percent you got in each category but when you pass they don't give you that they just tell you that you passed so I have no idea if I just passed or if I got like 100% um which I wish they wouldn't do that but I'm sure there's a reason for it what do you think yeah that's so when I was doing my practice exams there there was one um, there was one subject that I kept, you know, getting really close to the edge and I wanted to, it would have been nice after taking the exam to know how, how well all of my studying paid off and it would have been nice to just see like how, how, <laughs> what the distance was on that bar you cleared. And, uh, yeah, without that, it's just, you're like, Oh, I'm happy that I'm passed, but there's always like those lingering questions of like, yeah, but was it? Is it good? Am I really like solid in my knowledge or is there things that I should, you know, probably continue to try to get better at? Yeah. So, um, so a thing to note, I think the first year the exam was offered was in 2016. So we are still very close to the, to the pilot program of that exam. That being said, I don't know how you found it, but both times I took it, that was a beast. And I came out of there just ready to tear something apart. <laughs> was that kind of your experience as well? Uh, yes. So <laughs> I spent, I spent a ton of time prepping for the exam. When I get to the exam, uh, you know, being, <laughs> being raised in public schools in Texas, you're taught how to, to take exams or, you know, you you're less taught about the curriculum and whatever. And you're really taught a lot about testing strategies. So I take tests incredibly fast all the time. doesn't matter what it is. I, it's, I'm, I'm going to finish. And so I finished my examination with more than half the time left. I think it was like, I think I finished in a third of the allotted time. And so, you know, I was terrified that I was going to fail. I was absolutely terrified. And so I went through question by question reread all of them and that's just if you want to like crawl inside your brain and like murder yourself uh you know review every single question on the gisp exam before you turn it in uh, and so yeah it was it was bad um just the the anxiety you know because uh, it's not just it's not just the test right but it's, just, it's the test that it's only offered every six months and um you paid uh <laughs> paid a lot of money to yeah, do it for exam. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're lucky your organization is going to cover that cost um but i'm hard pressed to find an organization that's going to cover that cost twice uh you know i and was so... <laughs> very lucky because my, the organization i was with did cover it twice so i'm glad i didn't have to push that a third time <laughs> i don't think they would have <laughs> yeah so for, for me like uh, my organization was very clear. It's like, Hey, if you fail this, the next one's on you. And, uh, I still want it. I, I would have paid out of pocket to do it, mm -hmm. but for someone that's, um, you know, I, until you're like really well established in your career, I think $250 is a lot to ask anyone. Right. Um, uh, yeah. And so no, that I, seems a lot for a test, but that's the price that they've set on it. So that's what we're going to have to, to deal with for it. So that being said, it was, that was a beast of a test to do. Um, I hated every second of it. I'm really happy I ha I did it. I'm really happy that I passed it. I, I'm happy I failed it the first time and that I passed it the second time. Um, partially because at the time when I was, I don't know if, if they it had been better the next year, um, but when, when I was studying for the test, there was no study material, nothing. Um, they told you what categories you had to study four and there were like something like six six 
practice questions on the GISC website um, that were you could do in your sleep without having looked at anything. And they said, okay, there you go. I had nothing. So I was pulling out my old textbooks. I had I had kept all my notes from school knowing, not really knowing that there was going to be an exam, but knowing that I was trying to go towards my JSP. Um, so I was lucky in that respect. I still had all my school notes. I still had all my textbooks. So I was going through that. I was looking through anything online. I was going through every single Esri course. I was going through every single private course from, from places like um, the courses offered from SCOG. There was a lot of stuff I was looking through and I didn't even, I did not know if I was looking through the right stuff or not. Um, so this is why I'm glad I failed the exam on the first try through because it kind of showed me what I had to study for um, because I was definitely not prepared. <laughs> you just, there was not a whole lot of guidance on what to prepare for. So having done the test the first time definitely helped a ton because I knew what to focus on now. And that was a huge, 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 huge help um, knowing what. How did you feel when you were first going through things? Oof, so, Anything did, uh, had, did, was there more material? I, I don't know because after I'd done it, I was like, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> I didn't look at it again. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so uh, my cohort had a few more options uh, to choose from. By the time that I was studying for the exam, uh, there were two major GISP study guides, uh, one by Miklos Nadas uh, from uh, Akron, Ohio, and then one from the um, one from Micah Babinski. And so those were two of the study guides that were floating around. So they pointed you to like for each of the subjects, like, hey, you need to know like all of these things, not like the exact questions, but general concepts. And I'm not sure <laughs> that that was super helpful uh, because the it was such a broad spectrum yeah. that my my research and study time, I mean, I easily poured, gosh, I want to say at least 80 hours um, into studying for the exam. Penn State has a, a open uh, textbook called the nature of geographic information so uh, i read that cover to cover uh you know because i i'd never like had gis textbooks in school right and so a formal gis education so yeah <laughs> very brief one anyways <laughs> yeah the, the stuff that i did was more theoretical like uh, economic geography and and stuff it wasn't like gis for the sake of gis all of those kind of software specific things were just learn how to use the software. I, I going into this, I knew that I, I had a huge gap in kind of like what is the foundation of GIS. So that being said, um, let's kind of dive into a little bit of the material, not specific questions, but kind of just what you need to know. Um, so by the time I had gone through the test once and now I understood what I needed to be practicing um, or studying up on, it was very clear. Um, there's a huge component on the, I'm going to say the back end of GIS. So not only GIS architecture, but just understanding how, how a file structure works, um, understanding how basic programming languages works. And for those who are getting into GIS and you don't want to do programming, you're going to be doing programming. <laughs> and, and I'm saying that lovingly, um, you will get the hang of it. I, I know when I first started programming, it was this big, scary thing. I didn't want to touch it because that was for smart people. And in my head, I was not smart. Anyone can do programming. Um, once you get into it, you will learn it. And it gets easier and easier and easier. It's just getting over that fear of having to learn something like that. Jordan, what's some of the, some of the techni more technical side things? Um, what are some of those things that you saw in the exam that you wish you had studied more up on? Uh, so for me, GPS and, and satellites. Really? And, and, well, you know, like uh, my experience with GPS is there's a, there's a map on your phone and there's a map in your car and it, it tells you where to go. And I, uh, funny because I actually spent two days, like 
I had taken an entire weekend and I had done like two entire days just studying GNSS. And I had one question on the entire exam for, for that. <laughs> and I was so mad because <laughs> I knew everything. I knew all the constellations. I knew the heights that the satellites traveled at. I knew everything. And I had one question on my exam. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I read, uh, gosh, I had picked up some, uh, industry material on gps satellites and it was like a little mini booklet of like getting to know gps and i read that cover to cover and it was still i get to the exam and i have whatever stuff about that it it was was a a little a little frustrating um i mean from from a technical side i mean i think the the idea of gps is fascinating right of like triangulation and whatever but getting into nitty-gritty stuff like oh like i'll pass (laughs) some of the yeah, some of the database methodology I thought was difficult, right? Like I had direct experience with, you know, like setting up databases and why you do things in certain ways. Um, but only because of my exposure on the job and not at the city at my uh, consultancy gig. Um, and it, even still, it was stuff that was just barely adjacent to what I was doing. So I was answering questions, but I didn't really feel like I was I was getting those answers right um, during the test in the moment. Yeah, um, and especially on the architecture side, that was definitely a difficult for one for me because I had no experience whatsoever in architecture. Um, I know the first time I did the test, those questions, I guarantee you, I got every single one of those wrong, um, not having seen what my answers were for those. One of the things that did help me a lot um, is actually one of the ESRI courses, the GIS architecture class from ESRI. Um, And that one is a bit of a pricey class. And while taking the class, it was so over my head. I'm not even going to lie. I had no idea what they were talking about half the time. Um, But going over that over and over again while I was studying for the exam, it eventually started to click. And I'm not going to say I understood it 100%, but I understood it enough that while I was in the exam, I could see the question. I might not have known the answer right off the bat. Like I couldn't be there like, oh, this is the answer. But I had enough finally of a foundation that I was able to figure the answer out. So even if you're not like rock solid on it, get a foundation so you can figure the answer out. And I think that was really, really helpful for me. Do you have anything like that, Jordan? Gosh. Yeah, I mean, so... Like, uh, like, uh, IT systems type stuff, things that like in a regular and a dedicated GIS environment, you don't have to worry about because you got a DBA for that, or you've got some network admins to handle that. I, I think that those, those types of questions about, uh, about IT systems were, were super, were super foreign. Um, but I, I agree that, you know, having some information, uh, is, able to help you um you know definitely at least to screen out like super wrong choices and then so you go from um guessing your you increase your percentage of guessing it right right if you can uh get get something that's definitely wrong uh out of that list yeah um, so that's uh, having having a little bit of knowledge is, it can be an asset for for any of it right you don't have to 100 percent know absolutely everything I know, and it's a randomized test. The first time I took the test, I had 193 questions. The second time I took the test, I only had 161 questions. Um, Do you remember how many questions you had on yours? I don't. I don't. Um, Gosh, no. I mean, earlier you were saying, like, as soon as you pass, like, you you blacked that out. Um, I mean, I documented the stuff that I needed to document and saved it in my computer. Um, But, yeah, that's... mm -mm. But yeah, when I heard you say how many questions you had, I was like, wow, I, I do not even know. I was furious the first time I took it just because I wasn't expecting there to be that many questions on a test. And the second time, it was such a huge difference from the amount of questions I had the first time that I was like, what the heck? Um, but it's randomized for every single person. So you're not, even if there's another, when you go to do the test, you're not doing it with just GIS people. There are people doing an engineering exam in there with like mechanical exams there's all sorts of exams going on so I think I think the second time I took it there was one other GIS person but the first time I was definitely the only GIS person taking that test so people around you aren't doing the same thing 
Um, but even if they are, there's no guarantee you're even gonna have the same questions on your exams because they're completely randomized. So that's no fun. <laughs> but um, dealing with like the memorization aspect of it, I was a little shocked just how many random facts you needed to know and how many like figures uh, that you uh, needed to know. Acronyms, initialisms. Yes. Oh my, didn't even know things were things, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and then you get there and you see some of the answers. You're like, well, I definitely didn't I study that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot of things that I think we take it. I think we take the fact that Google exists for granted. If I need to know something, I just Google it. Um, you cannot do that on the exam there. You have to know everything. And when we say everything, everything, <laughs> which seems a, like a bit of an impossible task and it certainly felt like it, but it's clearly doable. Um, memorize acronyms, memorize, <laughs> memorize WKIDs, <laughs> memorize everything. <laughs> I think I had to do math. On one of the questions? Yes. There was, uh, <laughs> there was a little bit of math. And so the, the thing is, like, I, I got to that. I was like, I what? No one told me we were here. <laughs> I think it was somewhere in there, but it was it was pretty basic. And I can't remember. I don't remember what it was, but it was basic. And then there was, I had a couple. And then there was one I was just like, I can't remember how to do this at all. <laughs> this is why I have a calculator. And... I think they give you a pretty basic calculator, but nothing that will, you don't get any of the fancy scientific ones. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, the four function things. <laughs> yeah. So brush up on your basic calculus skills. You will need a little bit of that, but it'll only be for one or two questions. Probably. I say this, they're going to make like half the exam math next time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, what are some other notable things that you had on your exam? that that we can talk about uh yeah yeah so like um the professional practice portion of it right uh if you're in a job to where you're just answering support tickets uh, it's not going to be enough background information for you uh you know you really need to know kind of the uh product life cycle of gis of uh, what it means to take uh, user requirements and uh iterative development of a thing basically like how to talk to people that maybe don't know how to talk about gis yeah. um i think is something that again going I, the consultancy job really was just a huge part of uh my success for for this you know because we just we had to do all of that and um that's, that's something that stuck out to me while i was taking the exam is like you just had a job you know if you were just a gear in a gis sweatshop or something right there's no way there's no way you would like kind of pick this stuff up oh yeah i definitely i think a big part of the success i finally did have on the exam was having worked in an environment in local government because we were doing so much with the gis and i was involved in many different aspects and from from the database setup to to building our web layers to to starting programming with different um, languages i did a lot of python programming so that helped a ton um, there's a lot i can contribute to learning on the job um, there's just stuff i never learned in school so we i know we said earlier um, that taking the exam after school would be helpful but if you can't having experience on the job and and robust experience not just digitizing the same thing over and over and over again that's not going to help you if you're in a system and you're kind of helping building it or learning how to build it from the ground up that is going to help you a lot more yeah definitely i think that that's probably one of the one of the things that is not really discussed a lot is if you're in a i don't want to say like a dead end position right if let's say you're in a super entry level position and you've got like your one task yeah. that you're expected to do all day every day you really have to do more work in you need to network with other people and find out what they're doing in their jobs and make some of these professional friendships so you're just kind of aware of the breadth of the industry um, again places like uh, the gis subreddit is a good lens to see what other people do in their day-to-day 
Um, and then there's a um, Slack channel called the Spatial Community, and that's fantastic because there's all sorts of sub channels there. So if you want to know what, you know, if you have like a dream GIS job in mind, uh, the only way that you're going to get there is to find people that are already doing that job and figure out everything that they do and how they got there so you can get there too. And I think that a lot more creeping and lurking online um, is going to help you out if you've got it you know, a uh, limited job. Yeah. Um, And just get technical is, is, I know people don't want to get technical because it just seems, I keep using the word big and scary, but that's how I'd seen it. Technical was not something I thought I could do. turns out you can do it, Uh, but get as technical as you can learn, learn how a shape file is built, learn, understand what, when you open a file in, in Windows Explorer and you see six or seven different files there, learn what each of those things are and what that does. Understand file structures. Understand, go as deep as you can. As we said, the tests are randomized, so you might not be tested on everything. Jordan had a ton of stuff on on GPS. I had one question. Um, But the more you know, the better off you're going to be. Now, since both of us have taken those tests, there have been multiple resources that have gone out now. Um, they actually have, I think, a pretty decent practice exam that you can go over now. I wish that existed when I was doing it. <laughs> Very much wish that existed when I was doing it. Um, there's also several classes you can now take. Um, I know Teach Me GIS uh, has one of them. So, and I know several people have done that class and they've had very good things to say about that one. There's the Geotech Center that has a few things in there that you can look at. There's a, I think there's, they have, oh, they actually have an unofficial exam study guide now, which is Google, which is someone's Google Docs. So it looks like that's their study notes. So, um, and this is actually from the GISCI website. So they have, they actually have information on where you can get information now. Um, This did not exist while we were doing our study. So you guys have a leg up there. You guys have, you, they're telling you where to go get the information from. Um, That by itself is helpful. Not even knowing where to start getting the information. That was another whole level of hard. (laughs) Um, URSA even has a prep workshop for the exam. Do you know anybody, Jordan, who's taken that prep workshop? So I joined a Google Hangouts group. Um, I think, uh, again, Reddit. I can't tell I like Reddit a little bit. Uh, but I think on Reddit back in the day, someone was saying they want to make a study group. So I joined that. And one of those members had taken the uh, URSA workshop. And do you feel that that helped guide the group a little bit? Yes, right. Um, more, I think some of the issues with the unofficial study guides are it, it casts a, a really wide net and, you know, for a reason, right? There's so many different questions that it could be, um, but also making a study guide that basically has the exact questions that you need to know uh, is somewhat unsporting. So, um, you know, I think that the URISA workshop is probably a little bit more narrow than uh, the unofficial guides, at least the ones that were out in the wild, um, circa 2018. Um, and I know we've got, at least on the Arisa Texas website, we have started a forum post for people who are looking for study partners. So if you're studying for the GISP exam, go ahead, post in there. Um, and at least you can get some local groups going, um, because that's one of the hardest things is trying to figure everything out on your own. If you have people who are sharing this with you, it'll probably go a little bit easier. All right. You have any other words before we part ways, Jordan? Words of wisdom? Oof. Words of wisdom. Uh, you know, uh, for as much flack as the GISP gets about, you know, like paying to do the thing, you're talking about your, your livelihood here or your ability to get better jobs and stuff. And I think that uh, in the North American culture, right? It's, it's super pay to play already, right? You're paying to put gas in your car, you're paying to drive on roads. I, I don't know how that happens. Uh, you know, that, that's a thing, right? So if, if the cost of doing business is, uh, is a hundred dollars a year to keep your uh, certification current, I, I think it's well worth the price. I'm not sure that some people in the workforce are comfortable with the idea of 
investing money into a job you already have to keep that job. You, you have to, right? Even if it's not like money, money in terms of um, the GISP certification uh, annual fees, um, you really have to be investing in yourself in terms of, of learning new things, of you know, learning how to program, uh, learning how to do system stuff, learning how to like, talk to people. <laughs> Um, there's all sorts of things that you should be learning to do every day. And if you're not investing in yourself, you know, that kind of shows to me, that's like a lack of faith, right? Why should anyone think that I'm going to do good if I don't think enough of myself to invest, you know, time and money into doing what I do better? That's really, that's actually really, really good advice. Um, a lot of people will just get into the working world and just sit there. Um, and those are the people who get left behind or who get really, I say, bitter about their their situations, and they they don't do anything to to move themselves forward. The world doesn't owe you anything, so just remember that when you're going out and doing those things, you're going after the things you want. And as much as it sucks, anyone who goes and does that exam will understand exactly what we mean when we say that that exam is a beast and it sucks but it's going to make you better and it's going to make your life better in the long run by having just proving that you're willing to go out and do the work. Um, that will take you further more than you will ever know. I wish that's the uh, kind of bedtime advice my parents gave me. <laughs> the world doesn't care about you. <laughs> uh, so the last thing. I... <laughs> if you don't understand that, you're not going to do anything to, to fix it. <laughs> Well, I mean, totally, totally on point. We we don't live in a culture in our capitalist economy that like that cares about people, right? Like you you got to have a job, you have to have a paycheck, and that's what you do, right? And it just it's right, it's, it's a bit cynical, but that's that's how things are right now. And we're not we're not a Star Trek. We're close to Blade Runner, and that's okay. Uh, the, the silver lining to all of this is once you get your GISP the recertification points are laughably easier. Um, you get, you get multipliers on all of them. I am, uh, two years into mine and I'm crushing, I'm, I'm crushing it. Right. I've yeah. got at least I recertifies at least, this December and I haven't even tried to get the points and I have everything. I have five times as many points as needed in every single category. Yeah. Um, and I'm not like, I'm not hustling like I was to get the GISP. This is just normal watching webinars, going to conferences, uh, presenting. And that's probably something that I, I would want to change a little bit is not, not that I'm trying to screen people out and make them take the test again. Um, but I think that we could, the bar could be a little bit higher for keeping the certification. Yeah. Um, and the G, uh, GISI has even admitted like this is still a work in progress. So that's something that may happen in the future. Um, I'd love to see the bar raised a little bit on this as well. Um, just same thing that you just said, it, you had to put so much work into getting it and now you're just kind of coasting. Um, so that to me, I feel cheapens it a little bit. Um, I, I mean, I want this, I want the certification to mean something. So let's work on making it mean something and continue to mean something. Yeah. And the more GISPs there are, and the more GISPs are asking uh, GISCI to toughen things up definitely means more than, you know, the sour grapes type situation of people that don't have the GISP saying that it's fluff and that it's useless. Um, I think that, uh, like you said, there, there's, there's some evolution needed here. Uh, but if you want to have it change, you need to play by the rules a little bit, uh, to say that, Hey, I did the thing and I think it needs to change. There's nothing wrong with pushing the boundaries, but you got to, be within the boundaries first to push them. <laughs> well said. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jordan. This was a ton of fun. I'm glad we got to uh, talk about this, learn a little bit about you. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you so much. Uh, keep doing the podcast. It's great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>